Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that just came to my mind was that, uh, would you say that perhaps those studies that people make with uh, digitally manipulated images of women could perhaps track in terms of results with studies? And I haven't yet got into this literature, literature specifically, but with studies people do about uh, how men would be attracted to um, porn stars because they have exaggerated features right. that, that men like. Right. Um, that's certainly in line with it. I, I haven't seen that either, but I, I think the results of the experimental studies coincide with that, that, you know, the eye tracking, um, I want to say this is Varen Swami, Swami's research that I'm thinking of right now, um, that, that me, when you do the eye tracking, men's attention is focused on the breast area and then the torso and genital area. But when you look at perceptions of attractiveness, um, they're not, the eye tracking isn't completely redundant with what is rated as most attractive. So it's, it is kind of interesting to think about, well, you have this where you put your, your attention to, um, but are the specific manipulations really the, the, also rated as attractive? And, and part of that disjunction, I think, could be, you know, the, the low waist hip ratio, a lot of attention there, and low waist hip ratio is rated as, as attractive. There's a lot of attention to the breast area, but differences in breast size aren't as correlated with ratings of attractiveness. Well, maybe it could be, right, that there's some degree of disjunction there between large breast size and, and actual waist hip ratio. Certainly, yeah, porn stars are, are the exaggerated versions. And, and that, that takes us into a whole other line of research, right, when, when people watch pornography um, women and or men alike, are they are they setting themselves up right for danger zone because you have this perception that that's actually what's what is in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I I don't know if that's the case. It would be it would be I know it's it would be so unethical, but it would be so ideal if we could randomly assign people to have different levels of exposure to various forms of pornography and then um, look at, I'm thinking young men here, for example, I, I guess I have a teenage son and I always, you know, this is a conversation in my home, does exposure to these um, highly exaggerated and very sexually available um, females um, mess with your interpretation of, of the way normal females should, normal females should be? Uh, and maybe maybe not you know like we would we'd it'd be great to have some experimental um data to inform us about that of course we know that from doug kenrick's research in gutierrez that exposure to highly attractive women um, is followed by lower levels of commitment to one's own partner uh, so that's probably uh, uh, an indication of of what the effects of exposure to pornography um, on a repeated basis could be, but on the other hand, it's, it's an outlet, so. Yeah, and in the case of pornography, and particularly for men, because, I, I mean, men are much more interested in the physical side of sex than women, right, and, yeah. how, and how women uh, predispose themselves to a variety of sexual activities, let's say we, uh, men are more interested in, <laughs> in variety right. than women usually are. Uh, it's, uh, so there's also that component to it, because it's not just that uh, porn stars have ex exaggerated features, but also that they expose themselves to a lot more variety of sexual performances than normal right. normal women would expose them to right right that's a that's a great um a, an excellent point yeah you know and it's 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 so interesting too because you you also mentioned right that men are are they're they're more they're more in tune with the sexual experience, the aesthetic appeal, right, of just that seeing the body parts and and not to say that women aren't sexually aroused by that exposure as well but that that for them it is it is largely aesthetic and uh, and 
I think to some degree, this is where evolutionary psychology can be such an important thing for humans to have in their, you know, in their toolkit, like some awareness of, of men's and women's um, sexual strategies and the fact they do actually differ. And I, 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 when I teach evolutionary psychology or behavioral genetics for that matter, I, I say countless times to my students, you know, knowledge is power. I can't, I can't, I can't fathom how ignorance could be bliss, right? Understanding how genetic dispositions operate in the context of different environments is so important. Understanding the basic idea of, you know, you have callus producing mechanisms. If you don't activate those callus producing mechanisms, you won't ever have calluses, but that doesn't mean you don't have callus producing mechanisms. You have mechanisms that drive jealousy and what you may respond to could be entirely different from your what your male or female partner is responding to. And when people, I think, have some acceptance of the fact that males and females do have very similar strategies and preferences in some ways, but also dramatically different preferences and strategies, they can start trying to put themselves in their partner's brain just a little bit. And I'm not saying like, oh, well, my, you know, this men are so interested in sexual novelty, I should, you know, my husband, he should watch porn all the time. No, it's rather a, oh, so you you actually respond to novelty. How, how, could we, how could we use that in our own relationship, right, to keep things spicy, um, as opposed to the, the, a typical female not really caring about novelty or sexual variety or um, it just leads to a different dynamic for communication between the partners. Or, or the, the idea that anytime uh, I know a variety of women who feel that if their partner even looks at other women that this is sexual infidelity that this this is infidelity for them and i have a hard time I have a hard time accepting that position when i recognize that for males and i and i have never sat in a male mind i i, I can't i can't be that and and my husband says i would never want more than five minutes in a male brain that's what he tells me <laughs> um, yeah i know but um and i so i've never been there but my impression uh, of the re from the research is that for the male brain, a female is an, is an aesthetic object. And so you, you don't walk by an attractive female and not notice the attractive features of that female. And it doesn't mean that you want to cheat on your partner. It doesn't mean that you're going to fall out of love with your partner, but rather that you are just responding to people out there in the world in a way that the female brain is less likely to, and I'm not saying females don't, but they are less likely to respond um, to to males out and about in that same way. Um. Yes, and now that we're talking about this, I would like to go one step further before moving to the next question, because this is really a topic that interests me. Uh, we already talked about porn stars and the exposition of men to pornography. What are your ideas about uh, sexual robots? Because, I mean, there, there, there are many sides to the question. There are, for example, people who say that it would be completely negative because men would simply close themselves in, 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 the, in that environment and would buy sexual robots and would never establish normal relationships with real women. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there are also interesting arguments uh, on the other side for example there are people who say and perhaps they are a bit conservative about that issue that there are men that can't really quite establish relationships with real w women for a reason or another and particularly psychological reasons uh, because they have lack of an extreme lack of social skills or something like uh, that. And, yeah. and then they would argue for sexual robots in the sense that the sexual robot would allow for those men to have access to a sexual object, let's say, and to avoid them committing other type of atrocities that they, right. Could, be, right. that they could be predisposed to commit because they would have higher levels of testosterone without sexual activity, for example. Okay, okay. 
Well, I mean, to the degree that sexual coercion and, and rape may, you know, are, they're not just about power, but they are about sexual access. I, I, I can see that argument, I guess. I, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't thought a lot about this. Um, I, I would say that the argument that people will just lock themselves up in with their robot and never develop a, a relationship with people um, doesn't really track the way humans overall are a social species. And just because you can have intercourse with a robot doesn't mean that you wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, my concern is that the males would be very attached to this robot and seek some intimacy, some emotional intimacy with that robot and then not be not not get it depending upon how developed the robot is uh, we're we're making progress with robots as as far as i can tell um but i i think that that concern that males would no longer develop relationships with people seems i i, I would not argue i would not agree with that we are we are just a social species and we we thrive on relationships both males and females and we know that males engage in emotional, you know, they engage in emotional sharing. They do it less often with each other, but they do it more often with their female partners um, than uh, than male partners. Um, yeah, I just think some, that's somebody making like the slippery slope argument and taking it all the way to the end, right? Um, technology is is not going away, uh, and so I think we have to we have to tread carefully. But think about the ways that we can use technology to really um, keep our negative energies in check and also fulfill our desires while not hurting others, right, in the process. Uh, and I, and yeah, that, that's, we got to, you know, lots of, lots of decisions. And I think, you know, like, like happens now, couples, couples have to make these decisions together, Um about how they want to handle stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and now I would like to move to another topic, in this case, assortative mating. Okay. We, we, we've been talking a lot about bodily traits and what men and women like in the opposite <laughs> sex in terms of the physical appearance, right? Right. Um, but there are also other major psychological aspects that men right. and women attend to when choosing a mate. So, for example, uh, it is very common for people to prefer mates with similar personalities and similar religious and political attitudes, for example. Right. So, so from an evolutionary point of view, why is assortative mating in the sense that people tend to choose people that are closer to them uh, in terms of psychology, let's say? Why would that be advantageous from an evolutionary point of view? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons for assortment. And I, I think about it in the context not only of, a, of assortative mating, but also assortative friendship. Um, because by allying yourself with similar others, you know, in, in the context of tribalism, assortment is good um, in the sense that it, it helps people um, I mean, it can it can perpetuate tribalism and in group out group dynamics, but even just at the individual level of a relationship, attending to those who are similar to yourself it means that you are more likely to um, meet with strategic confluence. That you are both after the same goals. That you can work together. Um, you're less likely to come into conflict conflict with that person if they are. I mean, granted, you can compete towards similar goals, but you can also work together toward getting fulfilling a goal. Um, but you know, being at odds in terms of what you're what you're after or um, what you think about something can can lead to conflict, and and um, a lot of people don't really enjoy conflict, particularly in close relationships with with others, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think there's that element, and of course, then there's the the genetic similarity element. I think um, Phil Rushton and um, um, one of his co-authors, Bonds, I um, can't remember her first name, but they really made the case that people select both friends and romantic partners that are similar to oneself um, and, the, and the romantic partners, right? You have some, um, you're more likely to be uh, 
reproducing with somebody who has some smaller yet higher degree of genetic similarity to you than somebody nabbed at random off the street. Uh, and that is, in an evolutionary sense, useful from the genetic, you know, the gene's eye view. So I think there's there are both genetic elements at play and also strategic confluence and getting along uh, at play. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now I would like to ask you about a particular study that you've done with the trolley problem mm. <laughs> and and how would people choose between killing five people or one and for the audience and people who don't know about this the trolley problem is basically there's a railway and there's a trolley coming down it and you have a lever next to you and then if you let the trolley come down by itself it will kill five people but you can push the lever and it will only kill one and save the other five and of course there's a lot of different versions of these and joshua green talks a lot about that for example but in in that particular study you use the trolley problem and you concluded that people would rather save the one person if she was young, genetically related to them, or a romantic partner. Could you talk a little bit about the particularities of that study and sure. how it was relevant to understand uh, human relationships? Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, so in that study, we, we manipulated... Okay, so again, the, the trolley problem uh, and... Uh, Granted, this is one of the big issues with the trolley problem is that it is hypothetical. Uh, and I think people are now making scenarios using this where they're putting people in the virtual reality of the situation, which is super cool, or revising it to making it um, relevant to more modern days, you know, throwing yourself on a, on a bomb, uh, for example. Uh, but we, you have these five people who are who are about to die, and you can um, switch the lever and get the trolley going onto a different track. But on that track is this lone individual um, who would die in order to save those five. Do you act? And the utilitarian approach is to act, uh, save five over one. Um, if you are somebody who believes in fate and don't want to interfere with fate, then you might have the I'm not going there. Um, so. On average, in the generic scenario, people are more likely to choose to act um, and save five over one. And um, we were uh, manipulating that lone individual to um, increase people's willingness to, um, or should we say, well, mess with, decrease and increase, decrease and increase people's willingness to um, do away with that lone target in order to save the five. And so we manipulated the sex of the individual, male or female. We manipulated the age, uh, whether they were um, young or old. Uh, we had a, a two-year-old condition and an 18-year-old condition, 45-year-old um, condition, I believe. Uh, we also manipulated in another study their, um, whether they were a reproductive partner or a romantic partner or not. Um, we, and then we manipulated their genetically, genetic relatedness. So you can have an old person who's 25% related, they're going to be a grandfather. Um, so in the end, right, people are more likely to sacrifice the lone individual if they are old. They are more likely to sacrifice or less likely to sacrifice the lone individual if they are young. Um, if they are genetically related, they are, um, and with increasing levels of genetic relatedness, people are less likely to sacrifice. And the romantic partner is the interesting one, right? Because here you have this person who can take care of themselves. They're not genetically related. Uh, and yet people are, are uh, less likely to sacrifice that individual. Uh, and, if, and of course, they're a reproductive vehicle, they're your reproductive partner, presumably, so you should be less willing to sacrifice them. And in fact, people are less willing to sacrifice um, them. So, and Do you think that we could obtain the same results instead of putting their romantic partner in the scene, uh, putting in, it, in his place a possible future mate? For example, someone from the opposite sex who add all the good traits? Um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. And I think there has to be a personal connection there. So in my mind, this would be like a virtual reality setup. And this is somebody who is, um, who has 
been in a previous phase of the experiment that they have shown romantic interest in you and now here they are on this trolley um, or on the tracks would you sacrifice them in order to save five other people this is somebody who just signaled that they are romantically interested in you um, but I think there has to be that that very real possibility uh, and not that we don't value lives differently. I mean, I was just listening to Sam Harris the other day saying, you know, we say that all lives are equal, but the fact of the matter is if there's a burning building, um, at least for most presidents, people would go after the president who's stuck in the building before anybody else, you know, that that person has a priority. Um, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about, you know, e equality. But I think when you, when you become involved with somebody they become your romantic partner because they and and hence i say that it's important to have that 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 interest shown like if you want that romantic if you want that potential mate to influence decision making in the trolley problem there has to be some indication that they truly are interested in you and i say i i think this because there's some research to suggest that when people are in a relationship or somebody wants them they are more likely to want them back the kind of thing of like oh i have them so um um they're they're attractive as opposed to they're attractive so i want them or i must keep them alive um that that we become attached to the things that we have um, and of course the things that we think want us i think we also become attached to uh, this this is relevant for all types of things by the way i mean I, how many times do you do you meet somebody in a relationship and you ask you know what did you what did you what do you love about this person what made you fall in love with this person um or was it just the fact that they loved you is that what you loved about the <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? There's yeah. this, we have this weird idea of what are the causes of our behaviors and I don't think they always match up with the actual causes of our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, how do you think evolutionary psychology could help people deal better with their interpersonal relationships? Because, uh, I mean, I, I would say that uh, if you are to have consciously available to you the information about the subconscious motivations that lead you to have a certain behavior toward another person, and in this case, uh, in terms of friendships, for example, uh, that, we, uh, that you start having a rivalry with a friend just because <laughs> of this subconscious right, stuff right. we've been talking about here, wouldn't you say that if that were to be the case that people knew about this information, that if they were to start uh, behaving badly toward a friend, that they would at least think twice before, yeah. um, before making something about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm one of those people who likes to think that awareness of our underlying motives and factors that could be driving our behavior are, are important to understand because we have so much research in psychology in general that our perceptions of the causes of our behavior are often way off. And and that's not to say that the evolutionary perspective is is the only perspective to inform us of our of our motives, but you know, I, I, I feel like I have been able to use it to my benefit, right? Understanding that we're a social species and that we, we thrive on connection even when connection can be hard. Sometimes it's easier to exclude yourself um, but recognizing that element of, of, the hu of human nature uh, means that you put yourself out there and you take a chance um, on building connection with somebody and it can be really reinforcing. It's almost like exercise, right? Like, I don't feel like going to exercise, but we know how, we know it's good for us and um, social interaction and um, building confidence with somebody is also useful. I think that with my good friends, recognizing um, the limits of friendship slots and time to invest in close relationships um, has made me a more conscious friend and it's also made me more honest with um, the friends I do have. So if I recognize that there that I might be friends with people because of the uniquely desirable qualities that they offer me that other people don't, well, why wouldn't I go ahead and tell them that? Like, wow, it's so cool that you are like this. I really like that about you. And I don't see that in any of my other friends. Um, to say that is, 
is kind of weird, right? <laughs> like, I think a lot of people don't say stuff like that to their friends, um, but I do. And I do it because I know about evolutionary um, underpinnings of the way that we have limited niches for our friends, um, that we experience rivalry between uh, with our friends and we expect not to, you know, they're friends. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be in competition with them. Um, and just being able to say, wow, I really, I really envy how good you are at, you know, being a mother, or I really envy how, how beautiful you look in your swimsuits. Um, but being able to say that you envy it and you admire it and you don't hold it against somebody, like if you just recognize it in yourself and accept it and then be like, yeah, I feel this and I'm going to go ahead and let them know because I feel it because man, they're, they're great. And so, and like we talked about with opposite sex friendship, I think open communication can be, can be very useful as, as well, because you don't want people to be wasting their time either. If they're in a relationship and somebody is misleading them, you're wasting their time uh, or they're wasting your time. That, that doesn't seem useful. Uh, so, I think I think evolutionary awareness is really important. I think about this in the context of you know when I when in evolutionary psychology when I talk about um, waist to hip ratio, and I think a lot of people's minds just kind of open up like oh my gosh like men are looking at my my waist to hip ratio and they and they want to measure themselves and 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 I say you know it's not like it's not like men are saying oh look at her look at her small waist she, and her wide hips she can she can have a lot of children. You know, nobody's counting babies here. N nobody's consciously doing calculations about their reproductive success. What has evolved is the tendency to view that small waist as highly attractive. And so now they can articulate what it is that people are attending to. And, and ideally they can articulate why, but the, the life is just as beautiful. The waist, the, the body is just as attractive as it ever was. Um, I think about the context of, of maternal investment and paternal investment for that matter. Uh, we, we invest tremendously in our offspring and some people might think an, an evolutionary analysis of why is so twisted. Like you're only investing in your offspring because you want, you know, ideally your genes would get in the next generation. And from a genes eye view, we should be engaging in behaviors that, you know, get our genes into the next generation. Understanding that does not make me love my kids any less. I, I enjoy every moment I have with them and I uh, understanding why I love high fat, high calorie foods, unfortunately doesn't make me love them any less, right? But it's nice to have an understanding of, of why that craving can be so strong, um, why that bias toward my offspring compared to others can be so strong and understanding it doesn't make me love them less, but it also can help me harness my bias. Right when I recognize that yes, this is an evolved bias of, of favoring people and individuals who are likely to share genes with me and attitudes that I have and and so on. So I view it as all good in terms of at least if we have the right values in place, knowledge is power and power for the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't you think that evolutionary psychology, if it is not yet, it should be the core theory of psychology? Because, yeah. Because, because I mean, uh, in human psychology, all stems from evolution, even cognitive psychology, personality psychology, cultural psychology, behavior genetics, and all of those things, right? Yeah, I think one of... You know, it was one of those, and I had many of these moments with David Boss, um, but I remember him him talking one day, or I don't remember what the context was, but talking about how, and he does this in his, in his evolutionary psychology textbook, which has been a, a gift to the field, and granted there are multiple textbooks to choose from now, but doing that first and bringing that to the discipline was just tremendous because he is carving nature at its joints, and that's the way he talks about it, that thinking about evolution helps us understand humans and carving it out in a way that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, th I think about even, you know, the, the Association for Psychological Science, they, you have all these poster sessions and every poster is put, put into a category and there's this like short list of categories, where does yours fit in? Um, 
it could fit into all of them depending on what it is. It could be personality and developmental and it could be about memory and it could be about sex differences. Where does it fit? Uh, and I think an evolutionary paradigm provides more more realistic structure to what humans are all about, for sure. It's alarming to me that we have textbooks that really never mention family. Mm -hmm. Really? We, <laughs> like, how could we have a psychology textbook that doesn't talk about family? Uh, they talk a lot about gender maybe, but actually yeah. family and kin, extended family, food sharing, that it, like that's just such a huge part of being human uh and and yeah we have numerous psychology textbooks that would never just go there at all mm -hmm. and would you say that as uh, psychology as we have it today could be considered a branch of biology particularly because of the evolutionary psychology side of things um can you can you ask that one more time uh, if you think that psychology as we have it today could be considered a branch of biology, b particularly because of the evolutionary psychology sure, sure. side of things. Sure. Well, I mean, psychology is the study of living things, or biology is the study of life, right, and yeah. living things. And so I, and, and we as biological organisms, in a way, are. Um, so my guess is that Psych most psychologists, or at least evolutionary psychologists, would agree that we are, in many ways, biologists studying people. Um, and and we most, uh, I think, of us find it kind of alarming that your typical student in psychology never has to take uh, a course in evolution. Uh, and um, of course, SUNY Binghamton, I believe, has made some progress on, on in that regard. So, among other schools, I guess. I, I my my thought based on my experience and granted this is just my personal experience is that it's the biologists who we would have to convince because so many biologists um, when they think of evolutionary psychology they think still think of Stephen Jay Gould um, or other people like that who have kind of done evolutionary psychology no favors and have perpetuated misunderstandings about what it means to be studying adaptation, um, how, how evolution by selection could operate on humans like any other species. They just, they have perpetuated misunderstandings and confusions. And so many of the people who I talk with in biology uh, are, are hopelessly confused. Uh, they think I'm, yeah, and, they think and now I'm you're you're counting babies. Yeah, and now you're particularly, uh, particularly talking about uh, how people like Jay Gould and Lee Wontin reacted to sociobiology yes. in the 70s, 80s, yeah. and so on, right? Yeah, and they really don't realize that the field is so much um, different and so, so far advanced. Um, beyond that. And, and frankly, they didn't do a whole lot of service to behavioral genetics either. Uh, they misrepresented many of those findings. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating. So I don't know what other people would say. My guess is that, that, and maybe not all psychologists feel this way, but evolutionary psychologists, I can't think of one who wouldn't be like, yes, we are biological organisms. We should be at least in the sciences. Um, biologists are, they, they're, you know, there are many sub-disciplines within psychology and um, their exposure, even if they are evolutionary biologists, I think varies quite widely and they vary widely in their understanding of what our discipline is all about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so just perhaps a last question, because yeah. I know that Two of your favorite psychological disciplines are evolutionary psychology and behavior genetics, <laughs> and they are also my two favorite disciplines. So uh, uh, I'm very interested in this question. That is, what is the relationship of what would you say is the relationship between evolutionary psychology and behavior genetics, and and how would you say each of them informs the other? Okay. Um... Well, maybe I can speak to it best by talking about how maybe they inform me. Um, 
I love these two disciplines probably for the same reasons that you do. You know, they're they're flip sides of the same coin. We have one that's really speaking to our our universals, and we have another that really focuses on individual differences. Uh, we also have the intersection of the two where you look at group differences. So the which I which I think is a, is an intersection of the two for real. You have individual and group differences, and then you have universals, and you have kind of group universals, group patterns, uh, and so the two do overlap some somewhat, right? And of course, you need heritable individual differences in order to get evolution to operate. So they they do rely on each other. Um, heritable variation is is the crux, right, or the one of the engines of of selection. So I think they're important in that way. But behavioral, and maybe this is because I started in behavioral genetics, but a behavioral genetics mindset runs through everything I do. Because once you start thinking probabilist, probabilistically, and you start trying to disentangle genes from genetic influences from environmental influences, immediately you start being suspicious of causal claims because genes and environment being confounded is your classic example of confounding variables, which is relevant for research design in general. And so that that whole way of thinking, I know, you know, Matt McHugh, he defines behavioral genetics as, you know, the study of genetic and environmental influences. And you can do this at the, you know, the larger level of through twin and adoption studies. And you can also look at at the micro level through, you know, specific genetically informed studies with SNPs and so on. Um, um, essentially molecular genetic studies. But I think the behavior genetics, uh, behavior genetics is a way of thinking about the world that, that really breaks it down into multiple causes of, of individual differences. And then evolutionary psychology, same thing. It's looking at multiple causes evolutionary history and environmental socialization and it's looking at it over the over a long haul not just an individual lifespan but over the long haul so they really go together so well uh, and and I and I feel like I rely on both of them and it's kind of interesting to me when I meet somebody who's an evolutionary psychologist and really doesn't know anything about behavioral genetics and then I think how how can that be how can you not how can you not have that other side because it seems so crucial? Uh, and likewise, when you have somebody who's a behavioral geneticist and they don't know anything about evolutionary psychology except what they heard from a from a commentary uh, about a book by Stephen Jay Gould, and I think how could that be? How could you not? How could you be in behavioral genetics thinking about heritable individual differences and not have evolutionary psychology? So to me, it's more even just the conceptual understanding that the two provide that's beyond important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just before we finish, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet? And I don't know if you're also active on social media or not. Sure, sure. Uh, no, I'm not really active on social media. I think I have a Facebook account, but I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> I do have, um, I am very active at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, and uh, so I'm easy to find there, but I have a, a website, uh, www.bleskirecheck.com. So really easy to get a hold of um, or to find me and my and um, samples of my work and, and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Blesky Ricek, it was really a pleasure to talk to you today. I think it was really a pleasant conversation and a very interesting one. And I will be getting back to you in the future for us to have uh, other conversations because these can't end here. Good, <laughs> so, that'd be great. Okay, okay, and thank you a lot for taking the time to be on the show today. Oh, oh and please don't end the call. I will end the recording now, but please don't end the call because Sounds I will. Good. I will. I will like to have just a quick word with you. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have, be, have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. 
to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke and Nan Blanchett. Thank you for all.